Okay. Hi, Doctor. How are you? Hi, how are you? Doing I'm fine. Doing well. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Let's see. Before we get to your book, which I see the cover behind you there, uh, you are a psychiatrist. Is that correct? I am. And on your bio, it says that you practice emergency psychiatry, which I found kind of intriguing. So if somebody is having a mental health crisis, would you be called? I would be. I primarily practice in emergency rooms, um, a couple of them in New York City. So when people come in with a crisis, I am there in the emergency room there to see, see them. And um, in New York City, we also have special psychiatric emergency rooms, which is not something that you find in a lot of other parts of the country. But that's where I work and I love the work that I do. Well, it's not something that I've ever heard about where I don't think of the emergency room as somewhere to go if I was having a mental health crisis. If I break my leg, I would go to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. But it is possible to do that. I mean, you can come in there with mental health issues and you'll be seen. Absolutely. You can come in there for whatever reason. So usually I see people that come in with depression or that feel that unfortunately that they want to end their lives. Sometimes people come in and they are having a manic episode and, um, you know, maybe their behavior disturbed people outside of the hospital. And so they were brought there by family or someone else. So we are there to serve you. Okay, well, that's great. That's good to know. Is this available in most cities or is it just the, the larger cities like New York or LA? So when you go to an emergency room, um, emergency room physicians are able to handle and stabilize most people, no matter what their crisis is, whether it is a mental crisis or a heart attack or stroke. However, in larger cities, I would say um, maybe Baltimore, especially in New York, we do have um, emergency rooms that are specifically designed for psychiatric purposes. So um, you may not find it in every city, but a lot of psychiatrists, I mean, a lot of cities do have psychiatrists that might be called to see a patient in the emergency room if extra um, expertise is needed. Have you been doing this long? I've been doing this for about three or four years after training. Okay. What were you doing prior to this? Were you a virologist, it looks like? I was. So. Um, after finishing my undergraduate studies, I went on to pursue a PhD and I studied viral immunology. And between undergrad and my doctoral studies, I spent about 10 years doing a viral immunology research, particularly with HIV um, and all the research is things that would lead to an HIV vaccine, although we are not quite there yet. And then afterwards, I went to medical school and then did my psychiatry training. I fell in love with psychiatry, surprisingly to me. I thought I would go into maybe another specialty, but I have loved it ever since. What is the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist? Psychiatrists are medical doctors. We go to medical school for four years, and then we do an additional four years of training in psychiatry residency. And a psychologist gets a PhD and they also do internships and externships and have additional training. But we are able to prescribe medications, whereas a psychologist is not. But they also have a lot of other skills in their toolbox, um, diagnostic tests and therapy. And they also do research and, um, as they're getting their degree. So we do similar things and we treat similar conditions, depression, anxiety, um, bipolar disorder. Um, but our toolbox is a little bit different. Let me ask you something quick, if I could, about the HIV, and then we'll switch over to your book. Uh, you said we're not quite there yet with an HIV vaccine, but there is good treatment in pill form, because I know of one person who did get HIV and started taking one little pill every morning at eight o'clock, and his symptoms basically disappeared. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's living a normal life now. Yeah, that's the real marvel of modern medicine that um, while we would love to have a vaccine that prevents infection anyway, we don't have that yet for HIV and many other diseases, but it can be treated. And if you are taking an antiviral medication, 
you can live a very long, very healthy life. It, they work very, very well. You have to be consistent with the medication, but um, people, uh, HIV is no longer a death sentence as it had been almost, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago when these treatments were not available. So we've made a lot, a lot of progress. Yeah, that's great. I know we lost a lot of great people to HIV. And especially in this business, in the entertainment industry, there have mm -hmm. been many that, that went and it's, it's unfortunate. Um, okay, let's switch over to the other public health crisis that we're having at the moment, yeah. which is COVID. Now, uh, COVID vaccines, there's been a lot of debate as to whether or not they actually prevent you from contracting COVID. And I think the consensus is no, they do not. But it greatly reduces your risk of serious illness or death. Would that be correct? That is. I mean, the vaccines um, are very, very effective. And with the different strains, the vaccines are maybe more able to prevent infection, As but the vaccines are still able, no matter what, to prevent you from getting serious infection. And the point of the vaccine is not to necessarily prevent you from getting an infection altogether. It's just to make sure that you do not get seriously ill when you do, if and when uh, you do get infected. But um, right now we have a strain of the COVID virus that is more transmissible. So I know many people that got vaccinated, they were boosted, they still got COVID, but they had no symptoms. They found it on incidental, you know, routine screening, or um, they had very, very mild symptoms. And so the vaccine does work. How many people are running around, do you think, that are asymptomatic for COVID? Probably a lot. Oh, wow. yeah. Probably a lot. I, I don't have or know the specific numbers, but just from the people that I know that had COVID, even though they um, were vaccinated or, or if they weren't, I would say probably a third didn't have any symptoms. You know, it just came up. They were being tested for travel or something else. So. Um, but that is definitely not a statistical number. I'm just thinking about the number of people that I knew that had COVID. So with that, you wrote a book called Anjali. Did I pronounce that right? Mm -hmm. Anjali, yes. Anjali the Brave. Okay. And it's a children's book about children getting vaccines. Now, the age is five now for children recommended. Mm -hmm. Children five and above are able to get the COVID vaccine. Um, right now, only Pfizer has the vaccine available for children five and older, but other companies, um, primarily Moderna, has submitted an application to the FDA to approve a vaccine for children six months and older. So, um, you know, that information will be reviewed. It's thought maybe in about a month or so in June that um, application will be reviewed and hopefully a vaccine will be approved and available to even younger children. Tell us a little about the book. How, how, does, it, uh, how does it read for children? Yeah, so the book starts off, you know, we have a young girl, Anjali, she's going to the doctors again to get another shot, you know, and this is something that children do um, several times a year. They get vaccine shots, but you know, she's like, why do I have to get another one? I don't like get shot, getting shots. They're scary. However, her dad's like, I know you have questions. Why don't you ask your doctor? And so while in the doctor's office, Anjali, now she's a little bit older, six years old. She um, asked her doctor about, you know, why am I getting this shot again? What does the shot do? How does it work? And her doctor goes on to explain to her, how vaccines work, who made them, why we take them. And for Anjali, she learns, you know, how helpful they've been over the course of several centuries, you know, to protect us from infection and feels more comfortable with getting her uh, next vaccine, which happens to be the COVID vaccine. Are children recommended to have the, th the two plus the booster as well? It is likely they'll be recommended to have the booster and Pfizer recently submitted an application for a booster shot for children. But right now it's not um, an FDA or CDC official recommendation. Do you think COVID is going to become like the flu in the sense that we're going to have to get 
shots or recommended to get shots every year, uh, like forever? You know, I, I hope not. But this uh, virus is mutating pretty quickly. I hope that at some point we reach a level of immunity that, um, you know, you've had a vaccine or a couple or even a natural infection. And then the, the you know, the virus doesn't mutate, so it doesn't necessitate getting more vaccines. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, just in this past two years that we've had it, we've been seeing, you know, we needed to get a booster shot every couple of months. But I'm hopeful that it won't be that way. And with the developments in vaccine technology, I, I'm really optimistic that, um, you know, maybe we'll get to a point where we don't have to get boosters so often. But, you know, it still depends on how we um, do now because, um, you know, continue um, to get the vaccinations to reduce the chance of mutations, you know, if, if someone hasn't gotten it. But I, I hope not. I hope we're not <laughs> getting boosters all the time. Yeah, me too. In fact, it was funny because when I got mine, uh, the first two were great. No problem. I didn't feel anything, had no side effects. The third one, hurt like hell when they did it. And mm. I said, ah, you know, turns yeah. out that they had just taken the, the bottle of the, the serum, whatever you want to call it, out of the refrigerator. And it was very, okay. very cold. So when they injected it, it felt like this sort of uh, almost like fire going into my arm, right? Oh, wow. Because it was I'm so cold. You know, it was almost almost frozen. It was like very thick. So mm -hmm. when they put it in and I just saw, I said, what happened? They said, oh, sorry, we just took it out of the refrigerator <laughs> and yeah, it hadn't no, warmed to room temperature. Painful. Yeah. So, but I got through it. I lived and I'm, I'm okay. Um, mm -hmm. Why did you, real quick, why did you decide to write this book? I decided to write this book because I wanted a way that I could speak directly to children and, you know, it also was another creative outlet. During the uh, pandemic, I started working with um, ABC News Medical Unit, writing articles about public health in general, you know, specifically about COVID, but other issues, especially mental health as well. And I found that a lot of people would come to me and say, oh, you know, I learned something from your article. It helped me to feel more comfortable with getting a vaccine. But and I was giving a lot of talks to children and um, parent groups, but I wasn't, I didn't have the opportunity to speak directly to children. They're not gonna read, you know, a, an article, but I felt if I'm able to write a children's book, this is a way to help them understand a little bit more about this vaccine that they'll be getting and other vaccines in general. And I'm just looking for opportunities to help educate people because I know how stories were very, influential for me to understand what was happening in my world, not only with science, but other things that we go through in life. So um, that was the motivation to write this book. Well, that's great. I'm happy to hear that. I know that the kids really had a tough time with not only the vaccines, but having to be locked down and not being able to go to school. Yeah, uh, that was a big trauma for children and for parents. Mm -hmm who had to stay home now to, to, to do homeschooling for their kids and online. And so it really disrupted people's lives. And so yeah. Is your book out now? It is. It came out a few weeks ago. So it's available for all to, to purchase. Okay. And is it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble? Amazon, Barnes and Noble, other retailers where eBooks are sold. So you can find that on our website, www.anjalithebrave.com. But um, yeah, it's, it's there. And I hope that people really do find comfort in listening to the, um, you know, reading the story. And again, it's not a book. We're not trying to convince people to do things one or the other, one way or the other. I feel like it's more of a history book. Um, again, because we're seeing how vaccines have kept us safe throughout history. We're learning about the first vaccine, the smallpox vaccine, and then other um, different illnesses that have, you know, largely been eradicated due to other vaccines. So 
parents might, re- um, grandparents might remember polio. You know, that was the very scary disease um, of their time. Um, but a vaccine was created. For me, chickenpox. Everyone I knew got chickenpox. I got chickenpox, but I don't know the last time I heard of someone getting chickenpox. And so that's something that maybe parents, you know, or other caregivers might identify with. And then we have a COVID vaccine, which is what Anjali is facing now today. So I, I, I love that about um, our book. Okay, great. Well, Doctor, we do have to wind this down. We are out of time. Thank you so much for coming on the show and best of luck with your.